I don't want the pressure of making something a thing. Well, I'm not making it a thing. I'm just, I just think that with that, that's quite an interesting thing. I've had a, I've had my new. That's what I'm saying. But we can talk about it, yeah. Dan. An interesting one. I have no idea what I've ordered in Amazon. Well, you, yeah, I know, but that's you never know that. We got more, <gasps> we got more boxes than Amazon. I know. Is that camera getting me at like the worst getting, angle, DK? You your best. I've set it up for your best. Oh, have you? Is it? I was sent. I don't have to hold my tummy in for the whole time. Don't cut it or anything, but just let me just swivel. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, looks good. You know, with me, with my hated profile, because I can never decide. Right. So this I can. Is... I can move. No, camera. don't move it. Don't move it. I'm because it, it leads me into talking about something, because I can't see it, which is good. If I saw a monitor, I'd freak out because I've got this. Right. So when I was fifty, so it's before I knew Lincoln, I had my eyes done. Right, surgery on my eyes. What kind of surgery? Be, be, it's called bless blepharoplasty or something. Bless these bags. Bless these bags. Yeah. Basically, removal. Removal basically, service. Basically, obviously, when I was fifty, my lifestyle wasn't conducive to looking fabulous. You know, I was drinking and using and in a really dark place. However, even when I was not, you know, I still maintained a career. You know, and I still didn't drink every night I still went to bed and got sleep even when I was not tired hereditarily we have a bag here on the Welsh side of the family my son said oh brilliant and then you married Tim Healy because of course you know he's known for being a craggy faced actor so there you go but anyway <laughs> I am um, I had this bag and it was basically I'm I am definitely not the most vain person in the world I'm absolutely not Lincoln, I don't worry about going out without my makeup. I don't worry about wearing the right clothes and all of those type of things. But that's when I'm an actress or me. When I'm a presenter on television, I obviously want to look the best I can look. And it was casting a shadow all the time. Anyway, boring myself talking about it. But my then agent, Lindsay Granger, fabulous woman. She died a few years ago. She was the daughter of Stuart Granger, the swashbuckling actor. <clears throat> my God, she had a few stories about him. He was such a misogynist. But anyway... I said... You might need to Google him, actually, because I don't know who I, is. I'm quite well, interested. Do you know Stuart Granger? Never heard Or you'll know immediately Stuart Granger. He was in all the movies. He was married to Gene Simmons, the actress. Um, he out was, of Kiss? What? Not Gene Simmons out of Kiss. Gene I'm Simmons, only kidding. The, act, the actress, the wonderful I'm Hollywood actress. When kidding. he was 34, she was 18. There's a story behind that as well, isn't there? So, mm. God, bore off Denise. I wanted to get my eyes done. Now, as somebody on the television... We very regularly get people who will do treatments, invasive or non-invasive surgeries for nothing for you to talk about it. I knew, gob of the time, that I would, um, possible podcast title, that I would, um, <laughs> <laughs> that I would um, talk about it probably anyway, but I wanted to find the best surgeon in the country to do this at whatever price because it was, it's your eyes, it's your face, you know, and I'd never had any kind of surgery um, before. And I found this guy called Naresh Joshi, and it took a year to find him, looking all different research and whatever, but he worked mostly for the National Health at the Chelsea and Westminster. He was responsible for people who'd had major accidents, major burns victims, you know, responsible mm -hmm. for restoring their their eyes to their, as much to their former mm -hmm. glory if possible. And he did cosmetic surgeon on the side anyway i went off to see him and he did you're probably looking at me going no he didn't but it was 14 years ago but he did a brilliant job and literally three weeks later i was on television and you couldn't really tell there was no bruising and i always said somebody said to me oh you're on a, a, a slippery slope now you know once you've had your first surgery you'll never stop you know because they look at some of the people in the public eye who just go from one surgery to another and end up looking like the Bride of Wildenstein. And I knew that would never be the case, but I always said if something was making me unhappy and I could, I would change it. Mm. And what's making me unhappy may be too strong a word because I'm, I'm, I'm not unhappy, but I can't stand by profile. Mm. And I'm considering is, whether to get... This falls very harshly into the category of something that you see that nobody else sees. Well... 
Yeah. I'm, I never think I never think anything. I know, but I think that when you get surgery, it's like my friend who's just had her boobs done. She said, it's not for my partner. You know, it's for me. Mm. Her partner's fine with them. And, um, I mean, you know, bloody hell, I can play keepy up with mine. So, obviously, I've got a very husband who obviously doesn't doesn't care about that. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> I know it doesn't bother you, but anyway. Well, we've all got things that bother us, eh? Hey? Yeah. This well, yeah. goes back to... I, I'm not like Barbara Streisand who goes into places and has her own lighting crew and they light her from the up, you know, and stuff like that. Mm. But I'm very conscious when I'm filming anything and the camera is here on my profile because of my neck. So if I had surgery, it's not for my face. I can deal with that. And the only thing I have is a little bit of Botox once every three months, just a little tiny bit in here. I've got a wonderful woman, Sudda, who does it. Um, but it's here in the neck. And you know when you go in a lift and your face with all these mirrors all the way around here, it just freaks me out because I think, who is that old nana in, in the lift? And it's here. So that's why I was mentioned that that's a that's a 10 minute story of have you got the camera on my double chin DK? Um so I'm just shifting myself around. But it is something. I've been to see this surgeon called Norman Waterhouse five times. He will no longer see me for a consultation. He said, I will see you to do the surgery, but I won't do a consultation every time because you just keep coming and never moving forward with it. But he did say how well you, your skin had, uh, you know, the, the elasticity. Was it? Elasticity. elasticity. What he did the say was about five years ago, smoking I went and... to see him and... He he said to me, do you mind if I have a student um, in the room with me? And I said, not at all. And Louis was with me for some reason. Very odd Louis to come, but he was with me. Anyway, he said to me, um, okay, Denise, so what work have you had done since I last saw you? And why didn't you have it done with me? And I said, I haven't had any work done. And he looked at the notes from when I'd been five years previous and the notes five years ago. And he said, well, what's the difference? And I said, well, the only things that are I've given up alcohol and smoking. And he went, you have given yourself a natural facelift, which I had never noticed. But he looked at what he'd written that I would need when I was drinking and smoking. And the difference wow. was quite incredible. Even that many years on. Even that many years that on. And, difference. and he, you know, so. But what he said was, he said, with my work, because he's very well known for his surgeries. And he said, um, I give you the oval back in your face. So it's sort of, I don't know if you can see, but it's like you do that. And it just, it's very subtle. And he showed me some before and after pictures, which I love. Not of famous people, but of people who had offered to, you know, do before mm. and afters. And he would show me a picture of before and then, and, I, and he'd say, how old do you think that woman is? And I'd say, I don't know, 65. Then he'd show me after the work. How old do you think that woman is? 80, 80, no, 80. no, 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 65. But like he said, that's it. I just wanted to, it's not about looking younger. It's about looking the best you can for that age. Yeah. And then I said, how, how, um, how, how would I need it done again if I have it done? And he said, well, put it this way. If you had an identical twin sister and you had the work done and she didn't, you would always look better than her. Hmm. But I'm just nervous. I'm well, you've been so you've been talking about this for five six years no longer I've been talking about it but the thing is because i've got short very short hair as well and i love my hair very short it's where the scars would go as well dk is looking at me as if like oh my god bothered no this is but, just news to me i mean it's all I know, fresh I know. information it's just um it's something i don't really talk about it at length i'm not I'm not embarrassed at, at, about it. There's a few girls at work. No, you and, always talk about your women. friends. And, and to be honest, we've all, all like little it. nips and tucks done because we've all thought we could all go mob handed and get and get some work done and get a discount and then all go on Loose Women and just tell people it was the lighting because we'd all look so so much better. But um, but anyway, so, so I'm just conscious of profiles. Do you, you are you the sort of actress that never watches yourself back or? Or do you? As an actress, mm. which I have to remind myself is my real job sometimes, mm. rather than her who rants a lot. Um, as an actress, I can watch myself in anything, okay. to be honest. I, 
it is the one thing that I know I do very well. And I'm very open about saying that. I am a good actress. I love it. I'm very good at it. I know what to do. I'm an instinctive actress. I'm not a method actress. So therefore, I can um, watch myself in anything. What I will find nigh impossible is to listen to this back or indeed to watch Loose Women back. Your own words. Yeah. I, ca I, I, I can't handle it. It's like, oh, my God, shut up. Oh, God, shut up, shut up. You, I'm like that, aren't I? If ever we, yes. if ever there's something either Lincoln's been on or there's something we've talked about or a guest's been on that I want Lincoln to see, I have to sort of fast forward my bits. Not from the physical point of view, although okay. obviously I'm always going, oh, my God, you know, whatever. But it's just, I don't know, hearing myself talk as me, considering I do it for a living, I find really hard to... Um, to listen to listen to um but you know sometimes sometimes i have to and with this so what, what's this what, you've, what have you got in front of you oh this is just just during this week because i've been in london all week i've just jotted down a few a few little a few little things that i've been going on about because i wanted to talk about the um there's something i want to talk about which is more serious about adhd but I wanted to tell you, DK, how brilliantly the Gem Appeal video was received. Ah, this is week. the charity that obviously you're the charity patron of. People see a lot of my photos and the glamour of the Gem Appeal ball, which was Saturday. Obviously, it depends when this is this is going out, but you know, it Middle was November, November the nineteenth, yeah. mm. um, and we had obviously, you know, with your very kind help, made a new Gem Appeal video because the old one was a bit dated. So it was quite nerve wracking having it shown at the at the ball for the first time. It's also nerve wracking. I get myself really, really hyped up for this ball because you want people to have a great time, obviously, because it's a big pre-Christmas -pre big bash for a lot of people. You know, they spend a lot of money on tables and whatnot. But at the end of the day, the whole point of the ball is to raise money. But of course, what when people get a bit merry on the old um, alcohol, it's hard to shut them up. So I have to get the balance of being firm, mm. but not shouting, shut the fuck up. This is about the charity. I nearly get there sometimes, but I tried to do it with a little bit of humour. But anyway, you could have heard a pin drop when the video was on. And uh, Who introduced it? Was it yourself? or I introduced it. So I got up first and did my speech. Obviously, after this is, that was my 21st ball. Wow. Um, it was... Yeah, it was 21st ball. So many people there have heard, but I just get up and I and I talk about the gem appeal, which for those people who don't know it, and I would like to take this opportunity to say we all have our own charities and I support some much bigger charities that, that have a lot of support. You know, very special charity, Teenage Cancer Trust, I support. But that has a lot of support. Gem appeal doesn't. 20 odd years ago, I met Karen Johnson, who had two boys who had Hunter syndrome. Their life expectancy was very short. She then had a daughter, Katie, who wouldn't carry the gene, wouldn't manifest the gene, but would mm. carry it. So relief, Katie wouldn't have Hunters. But then when she was um, four, she was diagnosed with leukemia. So when I met Karen, both her three children had two terminal, one a life limiting condition. Katie is alive and thriving today because she got the bone marrow from Mikey. Both boys died when they were 12. Karen set up the gem appeal because she wanted to find a cure for her boys because there was none and there was not enough being researched, being done into these genetic um, conditions. So over the 20 odd years, we've raised three million pounds. I play a small part in that. Well, well you know. Well, I wouldn't say, it's, I'd say it's a big part myself. Well, they were and very see, generous you know, on the night. They were very yeah. generous with what you they said. You all work together and it all works out really well. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing that it is such a small charity. Like, yeah. I, know, I know cancer is such a headline thing and it affects so many more people. But, I mean, <clears throat> it was the first time I got involved with this charity. And when you see what happens and how badly kids can be affected by genetic conditions, that, you know, inherited conditions. Absolutely. It's crazy. It's that, crazy. I mean, I suppose it just makes you realise how many conditions there are out there that that just don't have a spotlight shone on them. Well, that's right. 
and and, it, and it's it, just down to this local charity to, to do local all of this work to do yeah. it. and and to support the willing unit that it's a, at the manchester children's hospital you know they wouldn't be able to keep going with this if it wasn't for gem and obviously there's no government funding for this it's all it's all just um you know fundraising and contribution mm. and of course since since it was started we have this enzyme replacement therapy um which is now it's not a cure but it is able to lengthen the lifespans mm. of the children so we celebrated didn't we in the video harry hudson who was at the ball who's now 18 and we also had David Alton come on the stage. Oh, did he come? Yes, he yeah, came because he'd been poorly, hadn't he? Yeah. He came and it was his 35th birthday. On the day, yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a nice photo of me, DK, which we can maybe, when this episode goes out, we can maybe flash okay. a few yeah. of these uh, I I I images um, of, of, of David. So that was really quite, quite special. The ball was amazing. Um, I was wearing um, a dress that was sparkly blue um, Cinderella dress. It was the biggest dress you've ever seen. It was the biggest dress you've ever seen. And the hottest. Is, it, was... is this the Cinderella dress from Cinders? From as Cinders. we yeah, spoke from about Cinders. Last, on the last episode, yeah. Yeah. Sharon Bowen, who is the most amazing dress designer and has created my ball gowns for 21 years for this event. She had made me a dress, but she's now living in Cambridge, so I wasn't able to get to her to have a fitting. Mm. And there was a couple of problems with the dress that because I wasn't well when she sent it to me, I hadn't really addressed in enough time before the ball to put it on and go, oh God, I can't really wear this because of A, B and C. So I had to say to Sharon, my God, your dress is so beautiful, Sharon, but I'm going to have to wear it for another occasion. I should have got back to you, but life has been so busy. I had bloody COVID, so I was laid up on all this time. Anyway, I had to go, I went to Cinder's and thank goodness they found this dress for me. When I took it off at the end of the night, it was the most orgasmic experience in the world. My noises were orgasmic because of the weight and it was like I was sweating so much. It was like you had dipped, Lincoln unzipped me and I was, oh, oh, oh like this. And then, and then basically it was like, the wasn't it like it had been dipped in a swimming pool? Yes, yes. It, oh you'd been, you'd been swimming in it, yeah. It's hard work, DK, because I'm, I get so invested in it. But um, we're waiting for the tally. But hopefully, hopefully if all the pledges come in, the charity will go away with about 65,000, mm. which may not seem a lot with some events, but to the Gem Appeal, that's a lot of money. Mm. Um, well, it is to anybody, but it's it's you know it's it's a lot of money. That's after everything's been paid and yeah. and whatnot. It was quite. Oh, it was, it was quite great! Magical day, night, yeah, very all good. Of me, me, you know. Loads of me, Corrie friends came. Lots of the Hollyoakses came. You know my obsession with them. Um, reality television which for an actress i get a bit embarrassed about because you know it's it, it, it's a cheap way of making telly and i should be very much against it but i'm afraid i just love reality television you know i can't help it so married at first sight was my was my last big binge and um so i'd followed a couple of people and they followed me back and then one of the guys came and sang at the ball because i'd heard him oh, sing on him. married at first sight so i adrian sanderson he mm, sang brilliantly great. didn't he impossible sang. dream he was Brilliant. shitting himself but he was so good victoria ekinoy ex cory death in paradise she's brilliant bloody survivor she is double mastectomy sickle cell amazing woman she sang um and um and yeah, yeah and it was and it was it was for all the all the crowd from Unbreakable, the series that we won. I think a lot of people were very pleased to see Simon Weston, our friend from he was the Falklands oh, yeah. hero. Simon's been a very good friend of mine for years, 25 years. I used to be patron of his charity, The Western Spirit. And he was in Unbreakable with us. So Lincoln had never um I'd met him a couple of times, but I'd never spent time times, with him. Never spent time with him. He's great. And um He's just yeah, and Lucy. Him yeah, and Lucy. it was just great. You know, Unbreakable was great for Simon's story to be told because a lot of younger people won't remember Simon Weston no. and what went on in the Falcons' War and how, you know, he had ninety nine percent burns and he's had one hundred and fifty surgeries and, wow. you know, it's absolutely unbelievable and his sense of humour is incredible is, is beyond, isn't it? So yeah, so yeah, so we had a, um, so we had an absolute uh, 
ball. And then I was, and a, well, we had a ball at the ball. Jenny Powell, who's going to come in one day and have a chat with us, and Bruce Turner, um, they did the hosting. Jenny's a brilliant host. Mm -hmm. And Bruce... Yeah, Bruce, Bruce done a great did, job. Bruce did a great job. Bruce is the twin of Millie Turner, who plays for Lionesses. And Bruce is one of those kids who he works his bollocks off. He wanted to be an active presenter, but because he knew that was going to be a long process, he was applying for jobs everywhere. He got a job at Children's BBC. Yeah, CBS. And he's worked his way up the ranks, and now he's producing Ambulance, that series Ambulance. So he's been in the Northeast doing that. He'd still like to do presenting, and he is a good presenter, isn't he? And his yeah, twin right sister, job. Millie, as I say, plays for the Lionesses. Mm. So does Millie, her girlfriend, Millie Rachel. Bright. Millie Turner. Millie Turner. And she's best friends with Jill, who... Um, Jill Scott. Who Jill Scott, mm. yeah, who's been in the jungle. But as we record this, we don't know if she's won or not. Right. But I hope she does. I hope she beats that fucking Hancock. Because <laughs> I tell you what, I'm not going into that again, because I know I ranted about him last week. But um, it's unbelievable to me, Twitter, this week. I'm sorry, everybody, if the jungle and all of the Matt Hancock stuff seems like distant history, but it, it's it's current while we're while while we're we're doing this. And if you look at Twitter this week, guys, I'm the bully. I'm the bully. Um, from Doris three two nine two followers, you know, and there's a lot of them, the people who are voting to keep him in. Why would they vote to keep they him are. in? They are. They're voting to keep him in. They think that it doesn't matter what he did. It wasn't his fault. He fell in love and I should shut my mouth because I had an affair and I cannot say enough that it's got nothing to do with that. But I'm a bully and they say, E, you're a terrible advocate for mental health. Excuse me, being an advocate for mental health for 33 years, patron of several mental health charities, and don't think that Matt Hancock should be being celebrated in the jungle, leaving his constituents behind and keeping us from the people we love during the pandemic. But never mind. I think me. he's I think he's put in on a real a so real I. front. I think it's a complete a, a front. A complete front. I mean, he should be an actor. So do I. I he's mean dreadful. You know, that's not natural. You watch him, that is, that is not how he naturally is. I'm sure of it. He's, well, it really is. A, it's working. He's putting it on. It's working, whatever no, the situation. Yeah, I can it's, see um, that. I can see it's, that. It's working. But I tell you what, there's most people in the street. It's so interesting, you know, because it, you can tend to get, well, I can. I can tend to get enveloped into the Twitter sphere of nastiness. But it doesn't stop me saying what I want to say when I feel that I'm in the right. But it was interesting because last night I went to see um, Elf, the musical. I was invited to the premiere of it. And my agent, Bex, looks after Simon Lipkin, who plays Buddy, the Elf, the main one who I was in Wind in the Willows with. Um, and you, indeed you introduced, introduced to my it, agent. Yeah. Yes, you're welcome, Simon. There was the red carpet there and, you know... But I got, not mobbed, not like I'm Madonna, but I got m so much, many people coming up to me last night. But it was lovely because they were true fans and it made me realise that the Twitterati is such a tiny percentage of what people think of me. I mean, you know me now. I'm old and ugly enough to be able to deal with all that stuff. Otherwise, I wouldn't put myself out no, there. Yeah. But it was... It was lovely to have so much. But I always said many you, lovely anyway. things said to me of what people on the street think of me because that's the forum, not Twitter. Mm. As to, you know, and it was just, it was just, it was, it was just lovely people saying mm. very nice things. Yeah, I was very glad to be there, and the show was for someone who's a bit bar humbug at Christmas. It was a lovely Christmas show. Simon was excellent. My friend Natalie was in it. She played different parts in Wind in the Woods, but she was the horse, you know, that everybody laughed at when she was the horse in Wind in the yes, Woods. Yeah. Natalie Woods. And Tom Chambers was in it, who I was in Waterloo Road with, who then went on to uh, win Strictly many years ago. So that was, that was nice. Um, and then coming out, I was with my friend Richard, and who we met on Unbreakable, partner of Stephen Bailey comic. And um, I said to him, oh, will you just wait till I get a black cab? So I'm going from the Dominion Tottenham Court Road to White City. We walked the length of Oxford Street on a Thursday night at 10 o'clock and not one black cab passed us with a light on. Not one. Mm. Mm. 
Not one. Yeah. We were on Shaftesbury Avenue. Well, we were on, yeah, we we were on Shaftesbury Avenue, minutes. just outside Soho. We waited for half an hour. 55 minutes till, till we ordered one ourselves. Yeah, about that, yeah. Not one black cab with a light on. The reasons are that during the restrictions, a lot of the older people just thought, oh, bollocks to this, I'm retiring, mm. can't be asked. Mm. It's never going to be the same. I'm giving up that. Yeah. And now Sadiq Khan is taking their cars off them after 12 years. Did you know this, DK? No. So you've got these sturdy black cabs which many of them have many more than 12 years in them. Perfectly functioning cars. And he's making them get rid of them after 12 years. And if they don't get an electric one, they can't drive. And electric ones are 75 grand. Is that right? Is that, is that, is that what they said? Is that what I they, talked to, well, you know me, cab. how much I talk to black oh, cab drivers. Oh, were you talking to cab drivers? Oh, my God. Yeah, I love, yeah, well, the, you see these things. You, you know can't, what Lincoln no. has on his Uber thing? Do not talk to me. Well, yeah, but you, you can write. Do you want to talk or not? I don't want to talk. Pick the. He says, pick the car. Oh, preferences. Do you want to talk? No, I don't. That's, that's got to be solid. I don't want to talk. I think you should have. I, I truly believe this. I think you should have a little thing on the window in a black cab. When you get in a black cab, there should be a thing on the window. And it should be a little thing. You know, like I do do not disturb sign sort of thing. Mm. You should be able to push it across. It basically says, don't talk. And then it's basically, what, you know. Uh, uh, what would Denise say? You know, where you. <laughs> yeah. Well. What have you been doing today, Chowen? No, I'm not always I, in the mood to talk. I know, I get it. But I you can that. make it... I wouldn't make it as obvious as you. Right. You just... Well, you know what you did once on an aeroplane? I wasn't on the aeroplane. Lincoln, and I do understand, so he's on an aisle seat. There was a woman across the aisle on the seat. He put his headphones in and she continued to talk to him. And apparently he leant over and said to her, I'm really sorry, please don't talk to me. I don't talk on aeroplanes. Well, I would have actually I don't died. talk in transit, is that what sounds, I say. That sounds pretty polite. I don't talk in transit. I don't talk when I'm travelling. Oh, my God, I would have died. Yes, but the do other you thing remember, that you do... Do you remember when you were sitting next to that lady on the plane? Because and you I, made me sit next yes. to her. Yes. No, because Right, so we always have like, so what happens is, right, we're going, we, we're coming in, in down towards the plane, right? So walking to the, you walking know... Walking down the, you to know, get the galley to get into the plane. I always check the... the, 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 the no. Lincoln boarding has, passes. Lincoln, I always control the boarding passes because I am the boarding passes. I am. Let me tell Mr. you about airport. airport, man. We talked about that. We did a pre-record. Everyone, no, we we have to do some pre-records to to keep us on air when we're not on air for loose women. Um, so we try to do them as live as possible, but that sometimes our pre-records. So we did one. Yeah, I can't remember if it was on the live or the pre-record. Did you watch it when when we were doing Airport Man? Yes, you mentioned <clears> that. Airport Man. Yeah. Lincoln yeah. turns into. Bearing in mind, this is a guy who, in his Soho days, was a loose cannon. Was The law was something that was for other people in many ways with Lincoln. Now, airport man. If Lincoln could go to the airport 24 hours before the plane left, he would. So when it says be there two hours before, Link makes me go, he starts with five hours and we usually compromise on three and a half, right? He will sit at the door if there's a taxi coming, like Paddington Bear, on the case with a marmalade sandwich, fucking waiting for the taxi at three o'clock in the morning. If we're travelling with our friend Angela Lonsdale, I can see them. They are both Paddingtons waiting, you know. And if the if the taxi is a minute late, they're ringing each other, right, the two Paddingtons. Anyway, we get to the airport and the passport is whisked off me, the boarding card is whisked off me into some kind of laminate situation and airport man has taken over. And he will hand me the, the boarding card, I'm allowed to show it and it's whisked back out of my hand. Um, and there was indeed once when we were sat at an airport and it was somewhere like Tenerife and we were sat having a sandwich and I knew in my mind's eye that we had hours until our flight was to be called. Mm. Suddenly, over the tannoy. For the final call. Lincoln, I see this man appear around the corner in a state of heightened anxiety with a red face going, get the fucking bags, final call, get the fucking bags, den, den, the, the bags, the bags. When someone does that, you go into panic mode. I grabbed all the bags and pulling the charger out, out the wall once. and everything. We ran down miles to the desk. We did. We, desk we ran the down there. Sweating, sweating. We got there. It was like 
they'd obviously said, would Mr. and Mrs. Ponsonby Smythe come for the flight to, you know, bloody Tehran or somewhere? It was nothing to do with our flight, which was three hours to go. But that's who we're dealing with. But I've lost my thread of what I was talking about, Airport no, Man. No, I, no, I, I, I like to position myself on the plane, so I'm not sitting oh, next to anyone. I so don't want to sit next you're to. You're going to tell a fifth, though. So obviously, love sitting with you. No. So what I do is I go through the boarding passes as I'm walking down, and very tell secretively. Me that I'm not sitting at the window, and I, I go, think, "Oh, well, I've time? got the window seat," which I, I haven't usually, and then I hand to the, you know, to the stewardess, and then and rushes and pushes me, I, pulls me back. And mm. rushes up the plane every time DK, and we travel quite a lot, and goes into the window seat, leaving me, the famous one of the couple, in the middle, well, famous as in TV famous, mm. in the middle mm -hmm. next to the stranger yep. every single time. So I, I, I do follow the, I'm very polite, but if it's a longish flight, I don't want to talk to someone I don't know all the time. So I get the book on my lap and I get the headphones on. And there was one flight where I did that. And I could tell that the lady, you get a feeling if somebody wants to talk to you because mm -hmm. they recognize you. Mm -hmm. And that's lovely in many settings. But I just got a feeling that I would be talking for five hours on this flight. And so I, I kind of, you know, I, I looked at my book and I had the hair, headphones in and stuff. Anyway, she sat next to me and we didn't talk. I was desperate to go to the toilet, but I didn't want to go to the toilet. So I sat there and Ellie weighed myself. Anyway, at the end of the flight, I didn't know she was with anybody. She got up and her husband was sat over the way. And we heard her say, well, that was the worst flight I've ever been on in my life. She was so rude. She didn't she did, say a word. She didn't say one word to me. Not one really word. Really loud, like we could hear it. She's standing there saying, but "Like as if, like we're not like even there." Like as if I'm a performing thing. Do you know what I mean? As if I'm, I was supposed to, as if she was like a competition winner to have a flight. Because I'm really polite to everybody, aren't I? I love talking to, I love talking to people. I just got the vibe from this woman that she would never shut up for the whole time. But that's why. Why were Why were we talking about the air, the airport seat? What took us onto that? Well, no, because we you were saying about we talk about black cabs, and I said if you could get in a black cab and basically have do not disturb. Oh so, yeah, I'd have it on. Anyway, so was a I was just of talking. Oh my god, there we go. Road. You see, because it's always the same conversation anyway. No, I know. Oh, all was, right, there, mate. No, all right, mate. How's it going? Of, no, no, I had some great conversation. I had a great conversation with a guy called Mike. I actually asked if I could tape it the other day with with Mike the the, the cabbie because I thought oh. oh we were having a right rant off to each other. But anyway, um, cabby talk. We can have cabby talk. Cabby, but I love. I don't always like it, but this guy, you know, often the cabbies know what my views are on things and, and will connect on that score. And obviously everybody likes talking to people who agree with them. So, but no, not one cab. And um, we walked all the way down, not one solitary taxi. But this woman cabbie I spoke to a couple of weeks ago, she said, my cab is 11 years old. It's in perfect nick. And I'm going to have to get rid of it next year. And I can't do anything about it because I just haven't got the money to invest in another taxi. So that's why there's no there's no cabs. And um, and it's a real it's a real shame because obviously even with Uber, which, of course, we use, but we try to support black cabs as much as possible. Don't we? Your family were black cabbies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, But you just can't you know, you can't get them. So I had to go on the tube on my own at 11 o'clock at night. That mm. was great fun. That was last night. I rang you didn't want to straight. Oh God! Yeah. God. I, yeah. It's a bit nerve wracking, actually. I don't. It's a bit with the world being a bit lawless at the moment. It's just there's an energy. There's an energy around people who've been drinking on a tube mm. when you're on your own. London is frantic. You know. I mean, I grew I grew up in London, as as you both know, but yeah, I couldn't live there again. No, it is. Yeah, it, it makes it's just takes my blood pressure up, um, especially going on the tube and that. It's. Uh, and the thing it's is, an experience it puts, in itself, you know, we, it? we're very lucky that we've we've got a flat at the minute. So we are kind of betwixt and between pretty, pretty equally at the minute. And, it, and it's great being able to just leave the north and not take a massive case and mm. stay in a hotel and all of those all, all type of things are great. But, you know, the idea was that we'd go down there and we'd go out much more in the evening and everything. And, and, and we have been. I think but we've there, been going out a no, lot. No, we have. But I'm saying there are times like... um. Like recently, where we were meant to go and see something in North London, and 
because of the cab thing, because of everything, you just think, oh God, it's it, it's much more difficult to get around in London. The traffic is so horrendous that you know in what would be a normal 25 minute cab ride, it can be an hour. Mm, yeah. I mean, today it oh, took no. me nearly an hour yeah. in the car from White City to Euston. That's a 20 minute ride. Mm -hmm. But that flyover in that past yeah, I mean, Grenfell yeah, Tower and all of that it's... thing was, you know, an absolute nightmare. What what I did want to talk about was her uh, DK. Um, was yesterday on the show, um, which I don't think has been out yet. You didn't watch the one about ADHD, did you? Yeah, with with, with Nadia. Well, yeah, that was on the live show. Of course it was. Yeah. It was on the live show yesterday. Of course it was. Yeah, Nadia was in the paper just... today. She was in the Guardian about was it she? today. Yeah. Nadia Sawala, who was one of my mates and um loose woman colleague. We've always laughed and joked about our the way our brains work, me and Nadia, compared to some of the other girls on the show. How we are both I'm always saying I'm a tidy person trapped in the body of somebody that's not tidy because I love nothing more than tidiness. We're not talking about cleanliness. We're both clean. I'm talking about untidiness, organized chaos, some some unorganized chaos in bedrooms, in houses where we live. I'm very tidy. No, please don't even go there. But, um, well, D DK's snorting because he knows that you have the Francis Bacon studio and worse. Nadia and I have joked about being untidy people. We've talked about the fact we've had alcohol issues. We've talked about the fact that we both have tendency to compulsively eat. I found that lighter life is a way to train, retrain my thoughts with cognitive behavioral therapy. But do I fall off the wagon? Of course I do. That's still in me. Like in food, in, in food. food, but yeah. st still in me, you know, in alcohol, if I was to start again. You know, I don't have the what one glass is too one glass is not enough, two is too many. End of story. Same with food if I get on that sort of roll. And just many, many things. Also, you will notice while I'm doing this podcast that I go off on a tangent all the time. Now, that's okay, but I can never remember the origin of the story. And that's not something with age, it's something that's always happened. And for the life of me, I would never have remembered what the origin of that airport story was. But as I've got older, it has worried me because I've got friends who are living with people they love with, with dementia, with Alzheimer's, people of my age. And we all do that thing of, oh my God, oh my God, Alzheimer's, oh my God, oh my God, OCD. And, you know, these are things that we shouldn't bandy around because OCD is an incredibly serious condition. But as you get older, things that wouldn't worry you when you were 45, but when you're 64, do worry you more. I'm not a health anxiety person. I don't live with health anxiety, but this way my brain works sometimes tires me out. And I interrupt a lot. I know I'm aware that I do that. Really? But, but, I, but I think of it as I'm just passionate about things. I'm very sensitive to not Twitterati stuff, I've developed a hard skin about that. But if the if a shopkeeper is short with me, I'll go home to Lincoln and be upset about it. And he goes, why do you care that the shop? And I go, because I wasn't, I was because I wasn't even, I wasn't pushing in. I wasn't, you know, I'm overly sensitive about my new tie of, of life. Um, and, it's very interesting to break those things down like that, yeah. But it's just me, obviously. And I'm okay with who I am, but I know I have things that irritate people. Anyway, yesterday, Nadia has been diagnosed with ADHD. And ADHD falls into the, oh my God, you know, I'm going crazy. Oh my God, I'm a lunatic. Things that I've tried to stop people say because of the mental health journey and don't call people certain names. Be careful of the terminology around mental illness without being too woke about it. Um, and, and, and similarly, OCD. I've seen people with severe OCD and it's not just I've got to make sure that I turn the iron off twice. You know, it's not, it's not that. 
But it's understandable that people use it like that, but we should be more careful. And similarly, ADHD has been bandied around as, oh, he's just a naughty kid. It's just much easier to give him a label and say it's ADHD. Oh, so you're untidy. Oh, so now it's ADHD, is it? And I, I've never said that about ADHD, but I have listened to people who think that everything has to have a label now. Also, ADHD as a diagnosis has been mostly attached to men. So Nadia, for the show, not for the show, she was having it done anyway, but told the show and they asked if they could send her to the top people and have it done as a, as a piece, as a segment. And she has been diagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Her husband, Mark, already had been. Mm. Mark is bipolar. Um, there were other things that were getting in the way of the diagnosis. When the show was over, and it was a very, very sensitive, to very important to see Nadia and her reaction to it, because it was a bit like a friend of mine's husband, who was in his 50s, has recently been diagnosed Asperger's. And he said, "You can I cannot tell you the relief it is, not because there's anything they can do about it, because I now understand my behavior. Yeah, It's explained. It's not a one of my favorite ex there's it's not there aren't reasons then there aren't it's not looking for excuses for, for my behavior it's lucid looking for reasons mm. and i've always said that about my alcoholism and about my drug use and about certain things is that i can't excuse any of my behaviors but if you look into it there are often reasons mm. when i've been judged for things quite rightly so i heard that on on a podcast um emily dean was interviewing lee mack Oh yeah, and he was diagnosed with ADHD a couple of years ago. Was he? Yeah, yeah, and it, and it explained it. It was very therapeutic for him to get the diagnosis because it, it, it explains a lot. Yeah, for it him, and explains a lot. You can and... see it from our point of view as well. You know, when you look at him and and how how sharp he is and how quick he is and how his brain is just working twenty four seven. And it's a bit like you know how active I am on with things like the way I was during the pandemic because I felt. As a non-religious person, a lot of the bullshit that was going on, I felt like I had a calling. You know, when people say they have a calling to do something. It's the first time in my life, politically, I've felt a calling to speak out. And it was speaking out to the point that Lincoln was worried about my mental health, my physical health. We had a stalker. Was the stalker doing this because of my stance on COVID restrictions and how it was affecting people and the bullshit that I knew was going on in Downing Street and, you know, all of all of these things. That, But it was like, I was, I felt like I was carrying it for the whole country. It was ridiculous. And similarly now, things like the Matt Hancock thing, it's like the girls at work are going, because I, I, they said yesterday about me, having a diagnosis, you know, should I go? And I said, yeah, but you're trying to change my personality. You know, the fact that I am more passionate about things than you guys, the fact that I'll put my head on the parapet more than you guys doesn't make, and they were going, no, 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 Den. We just sometimes worry about you, that we wish that you didn't take on well, I, this is the what, worries of well, the world so much. I say to you as well. When you can't do anything. I say these things to you all the time. Actually. I know you do, but then I, but then I get cross with you by yeah, saying, I know you do. but you're not... But if everybody was quiet and nobody did anything, change wouldn't happen. I know that I can't change certain things, but I still feel if I don't say anything, I'm letting people down. But I wish that I could quieten my mind about it because things do live, the, you know, the sort of expression that people use, rent free in my mind when I don't want them to because I'm 64, I get quite emotional about this because I'm 64 and I want to enjoy whatever time I have left. I don't want to stop being involved and, and connected and have a voice, but I want to stop being frustrated with those who don't, who choose not to use it. I want to, I want to quieten my mind and what Nadia has said, because I said, the thing is, I'm on an antidepressant, I'm on hormone treatment. I don't want to change my personality and I don't want to 
affect any drugs that I've had, you know, that because uh, I've been diet depression free for three years. Mm. And she said to me, Den, what I'm on has just made sense of stuff in my head. Now, I'm talking about this because it only happened yesterday. I've got a lot more to discover, even about Nadia's story, mm. you know? Yeah. So I'm not suddenly going, oh, I'm sure I've got this. I'm an authority on it. I'm just simply relaying what happened yesterday. Yes. Do you know on the NHS at the moment, guys, there is a waiting list of seven years. Mm. Imagine that difference in seven years somebody could make to be diagnosed. Imagine with young children who are just treated as, well, it's a bit like with dyslexic kids. For years, they were the thick kids. You know, when you think of all those poor children who would have been forced to wear the dunce's cap at school, mm. you know, in the, in, mm. you know, even in my day, the dunce's cap was kind of still around. Mm. And many of those children, listen, some kids are just little shits. Some adults are just untidy, big shits. But it's- Don't look um, at me. Well, I'm not Don't, looking at the you. The both of you were looking at no, me. We what are your thoughts? Is it something you know much about, DK? I really don't, but um, it's evident. My kids are at school, you know, in very early primary years, and it's interesting to see all the different characters amongst all the kids. And, you know, you wonder as an yeah. adult in our society now when we're aware of all these things, you kind of look at children and you think, hmm, I wonder... You know, but then you don't want to overtest. You no, know, you as don't. As a parent and as a friend of other parents of kids, you don't want to second guess. And and no. like some some parents do have a lot of problems with their kids. You know, in yeah. terms of behavioural and, and and learning situations. Um, we're we're quite lucky. My wife's a teacher, and and she can sort of take our kids under her wing and and guide them forwards. Yeah. But to be fair, if it wasn't for her, I think our kids could struggle pot uh -huh. potentially. You know, slip behind and then as my wife says, would always then be behind, behind school. Yeah. Because the 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 size of the classes just doesn't allow for catch doesn't, up. Doesn't allow for catch up and differentiation to the point where they can, yeah, make a difference. With my depression, DK, I mean, one of my passion projects that if I just if I just had loads of money that I could just pour into a project, you know, it would be a three-part, remember I've said this for years, haven't I? A three-part mental health story to show, obviously, like how- a film or a book <clears throat> or? A documentary. A documentary. Okay. a documentary about, obviously, the end would state that we still have so far to go, but just how far we've come since I've Mm. had it 33 years but when i think that when i w first had it when i had matty there was nowhere had i not had the the f this is something i have said many times in different forums had i not had the family that i had would i be here i now, don't you're, know you're talking about postnatal depression so you well said, i'm talking about yeah. postnatal depression which you were started became, which is, which is the origins for many women. And sometimes, and again, I reiterate for women who are pregnant or have just had a baby, in most cases, postnatal depression will be milder. Even in cases where postnatal depression or illness is severe, they will make a full recovery. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for me, it opened up a tendency to a life of clinical depression slash major depressive or de major depressive disorder which is tends to be called now not quite sure why they made the terminology different but nevertheless they're both the same thing but when i was first diagnosed there was nowhere to go mm. you know that's why i spoke out about it i think that was the start of me when other people tried to shut me down mm. For my own good, not well, for anybody else's good. Imagine you speaking out about it compared to how many thousands of women or men at that time weren't speaking out Nobody about was. it. Nobody was. As far as I'm well, aware... Well, you were warned not to speak out about it. I was, I was advised. By, professionally. I was advised by my Career. agent hmm. at the time who, okay, he was 135, but he, you know, he absolutely said, oh, my dear. You mustn't be talking about this. People will think you're mad. You'll never work. And 
My family, much as they supported me in everything, were worried that the pressure would be too much. And they also did worry that because people didn't understand it, that it would affect my, at that point, burgeoning mm. career that was sort of, I'd been in the theatre for 10 years, but my television thing was just starting mm. to happen, mm. In a, you know. And um, it was... And I didn't know a lot about it. I just knew that I had nowhere to go. There would be articles in magazines. You know, you'd buy, the the shelves were stacked. Obviously nothing was online. We didn't have online in those days. We didn't have Google. The shelves were stacked with your parent and baby magazines, all of which featured the smiling perfect mother and the smiling perfect child. And there would be all these articles about the physical things that might happen. And in a tiny corner would be, if the baby blues persist in more than three or four days, go see your GP. That was it. I found one address, which was for the, a thing called the Association for Postnatal Illness. There was no telephone number. They required a letter. DK, I couldn't lift up my own toothbrush. You know, I was catatonic. I was so ill. Had it not been for my mum, who took unpaid leave from work, I don't know where I would have been. My mum and my dad and my sister and my then husband, Tim, knew that what I had was a serious illness. It was never questioned. But as I became more involved in the depression world, I realized that I was in the minority, that most people had done the, I mean, how long is this gonna go on for? She's had it how long now? The baby's a month? Take her to the Metro Centre and buy her a dress. Yeah, well, that was what the big, that's why you said in three parts for this documentary, because if you look back to the first part would be, you know, how, how was it handled in the big, that's you know, you bringing years. me back to the yeah. beginning again, so, which is yeah. what you should do. Yeah. The, the point of this passion project would be, if you go back to the days of the philosophers like Homer, people like that, they talked about melancholia. People would die, melancholia, which was depression, but it was undiagnosed. That's just what they called it. People over the years were written off. People still think of ECT, electric shock treatment, which is electrocardio- Convulsive. Some, convulsive yeah. treatment, but we call it electric shock treatment, don't we? They still think of it as a terrifying treatment of the days when you see these Victorian films where you know, women mostly are shackled to a, you know, with great big sort of steel things shackling them to a bed and all this voltage going through them. In theory, that is what happens. But the origin of ECT, which I thought was fascinating, because I always wondered how they would find that this thing going through your brain would, would stop thick, black, immovable depression when nothing else works is because epilepsy is a separate condition to depression. But obviously some people with epilepsy will also suffer from depression. They discovered that when an epileptic fits, they can fit themselves out of a depression. Okay. So whatever is going on to cause the fit the result would often mean that the epileptic person who was also suffering depression, it would lift the depression. This so interrupted the electrical pathways. Something like that. And as I say, when I talk about depression, I don't profess to be any medic on it. This is mm. just stuff I've learned as a lay person. As a lay person, I know a lot about the condition. And um, I found that fascinating. They were once going to take me to have it done. Um, but it turned around with something as simple as the holiday that I was going on and dreading. They took it, my mum and dad took it out of my hands and cancelled it and said, the mm. people you're going with aren't disappointed at all, they're totally mm. fine. Mm. And it started to lift because my depression was so bad I couldn't speak. Mm. And the doctor came around and he said, I'm booking you in for ECT tomorrow because it was immovable, but I didn't have to have it. But I know people for whom it's been a great success. Mm. Um, I'm not saying it's not frightening, but the point being is that I would love to do a documentary that starts back in the day mm -hmm. and we realise the treatments that were going on in, you know, in your mental hospitals. My mum used to work in Prudhoe Mental Hospital, which was for the, the, the mentally handicapped. 
So these people, my mum used to say to me, my mum worked on a ward called Sagan and uh, she and there were people who were literally so mentally um, poorly that they were, um, you know, rocking in a, in, in a chair in a corner and had been like that for many years with no hope of ever coming out of that. And my mum said that many of those people, women, would have been put into the hospital for undiagnosed postnatal depression and undiagnosed menopausal symptoms and then became completely and utterly institutionalised mm. because there was no, it was just, you've got to pull yourself together. We didn't have that in my day. You know, and yet when you talk to people of my then grandmother's generation, my granny's generation were the most unsympathetic to my illness because they all said, well, we didn't have that in my day. You just had to get on with it. But then you'd say, I've said this many times to you, Granny, what happened to Auntie Vera? Oh, she um, she went a bit funny after the birth. And they were just put away. They were taken away. Um, but they never, but when I talked about postnatal depression, it never, they never related that to Auntie Vera going a bit funny and just going away. It was interesting. Mm -hmm. So I've read and learned so much and it would just be to me fascinating to start with how, how there was no treatment. When we've been, you've been with me, I don't know if you were there when they showed, I'm a patron of mind and as many times as I can go to the mind awards. And there are often films from all over the world that people have made. Um, and they are how different countries and cultures treat or, or not treat mental health issues. And it's terrifying, it's terrifying. I think these days, you know, often you can't wait for things to be commissioned, you know, if you don't get off your ass and sometimes, but if you make something on commission, commissioning that because it will make a difference to the future. I think it will. I just think that it will be, it would be fascinating. I think for people to learn in a, if the story is told in a, when I say entertaining, there's nothing entertaining about depression, but made in a fascinating way for people to understand it. Because people do log in when I'm talking about my illness, because they don't, it's not something if you haven't, it's like anything, if you haven't been touched by it, it's like ADHD. I'm not touched by it, so I didn't really invest in the story of it until yesterday. But depression is very common. A yeah. lot of people will either have had it or have been touched by it, a member of their family. Yeah, right? they have, but they don't know very much about it, mm. which is why my book did well and which is why people say to me, I didn't know about that until I read your book. How did the short film with Louis come about then? That was something I did on, on my own. I'll tell you <laughs> where the money came from. It for, from. I was involved in, um, I was hacked by the Mirror Group for several years, as many of us were on the television which caused major distress to me and to my family. And because what happens as a result of being hacked is that you lose trust in everybody around you because you don't, because at the time I was hacked, we were all hacked. We didn't know hacking could happen. Mm. So things were discovered about us that ended up in the newspapers that the only way in our minds it could have got there was by somebody we trusted telling people. Right. So you therefore are confronted with stories that only either a member of your family or a yeah. trusted friend knows. Right. And that ends up being in the papers. So it's either the person's gone to the papers or they've told somebody that they shouldn't have told. Yeah. So you end up being in a situation, especially my life was a bit out there. So I would just live in a world where I thought the paps just know where I am all the time. But in fact, they didn't. They were listening to my phone and to my answer machine messages. And not only were they doing that, which we then discovered, when I was obviously with Lincoln, we discovered it. They were um, hiring people to put a bug into my hotel bedroom at, the, at a hotel in London, um, the St. George's Hotel in Regent's Park, which isn't there anymore but it was at the time. And um, on two occasions, they bugged my bedroom. Um, and also after 9-11, um, I had been with 
I, I was in a really bad state. I was filming The Vice. Everybody was in a bad state, but it brought, I, I ended up dipping into a massive episode of depression and having to continue filming. And it was really awful. And um, I, um, I met with a, a bunch of uh, people and I was doing cocaine at the time to try and medicate everything. It was just awful. Anyway, I was befriended by this girl in a bar who I took under my wing. She was this poor little rich girl called um, Mina. Mina, I think. Anyway, we swapped numbers and she contacted me over the years. Not over the years, over the next few weeks. Was I going to be in London? How fabulous it was to meet me. Would I go on her dad's boat with her up the Thames? Bearing in mind, I had Matthew, who was 12, and a newborn baby. So I'm I'm being, you know, 99% of the time, I'm not partying, I'm being a mom. So when she would ring me, I was, oh, hi, Mina. Um, no, I can't. I'm I'm in the north. I'm taking Matthew to school. I'm going to his parents' night. I'm bathing Louis. I'm doing all of this. So 20 of possibly 21 phone calls she made to me, that was my life. To the point that she became quite persistent, you know, but I really want to see you. We had such a great night in London. And I eventually, I don't know if you can see this, but I'd eventually see her number. I don't know why I answered it, but I'd go, you know, hi, Mina, you know, and I was also doing, I was doing a show called Soap Fever that I did for ITV2. I don't know why I remember her ringing me then. But anyway, the story goes that I then went to Spain for a weekend to do a photo shoot with Beverly Callard and Gabby Glaster. We were all in Corrie together. I decided to stay an extra day. They came back pissed down after they'd gone. So I just it was a waste of time staying. And that night I got a phone call from Mina and I was in a position to talk to her for ages because I was in the pouring rain in my then flat in Spain. It sounds like I was the most naive person in the world. I wasn't naive, but she was very clever. And she was chatting to me and I'm chatting to her and she's talking about a party and had I ever done cocaine? And I said, yes you know, high days and holidays, this, that and the other, blah, blah, blah. And um, thought nothing more about it. And I kept, flew back from Spain, went to a friend's birthday party with Matty and Louis in arms in Somerset with my parents. 70s party, we're all dressed up in the big wigs. Flared trousers and the works. And I get a phone call from the Daily Mirror, Sunday Mirror, saying, hi, Denise, this is I don't remember, Ben Bloggs from the Sunday Mirror. Please don't blame me. I'm only the messenger, but the sun are running a big story tomorrow about your cocaine use and your partying and your this, that and the other. And I said, well, that's not true. And he said, we've got the tape. I didn't think to ring a lawyer. I was cold. I couldn't think what tape they had, who they had a tape from. My friends were there, a bunch of my gay friends who were all gossips, loved dearly. One of them is no longer here. And I blamed them all. Must have been you. You're a journalist. Lester, this, that and the other. Horrendous. And I, I got my friend Stephen to, it was in the days where the papers came out at 10.30 at night at the railway stations in London. Mm. And I got my friend Stephen, whilst all the time trying to pretend I'm having a great time at this party. I got Stephen to go to King's Cross and he rang me and he said, it's fucking terrible. And it was across the whole front of the page, my cocaine exclusive. And I had a 12 year old son downstairs and it was just horrendous. I don't condone what I did. Anyway, I sat bolt upright at three in the morning and it's the first time that it occurred to me that it was her because of what I'd said, you know, in the article. And um, I rang her and I just said, and you know, she went to me three in the morning. Hi. I said, hi, Mina, it's Denise. She went, hi, babe. How are you? I said, all I'm saying is that I hope that you enjoy your blood money and that your parents are very proud of you and put the phone down, that's the last I spoke. And I turned out that she, she was Myra Mahmood, who was the cousin of Mazia Mahmood, 
who you may remember as the fake shake, mm -hmm. who was setting up members of the royal family oh, and yeah. stuff for the news of the world. Yeah. She was his cousin. Oh. And it all turned out when I eventually met the guy who had hacked me because he had a breakdown and came clean, that it was all set up. So she hadn't just bumped into me in this oh. bar. She'd been sent. Yeah. I'd been set up. Yeah. I'd been, what's the word? Begins with an E. Entrapped. Entrapped. It was ent entraption. Is that Trapment. word? Entrapment. Mm. Entrapment. Um, and, mm. and subsequently, I had to spend five hours in Putney Police Station because the guy who um, had hacked me had a breakdown. And he had, he'd been on the crime side of the mirror, not the showbiz side, the crime side. And somehow he had been set to trap me, to, to hack me. He didn't want to do it, but he was told he had to. And this is where it goes into like a Sherlock Holmes mystery. He'd been sent to the hotel where I was staying at. In all of these documents, I'm referred to as DW. You see your life in front of you. Mm. And op he had been told to book the hotel room opposite to me. As he got there, coming out of my room were two guys. And he said, I'm from the mirror, who are you? And they said, we're from a... <laughs> this honestly sounds like I'm making it up, but it's all there. We're from an investigation company called Tipping and Dove. And we've been hired to put a bug into Denise Welsh's bedroom. And um, there you go. And that's what happened. And then I, um, I had had an extramarital affair when I was married. He had sold a story. It was horrendous for me. It was my fault I had the affair, but it was horrendous. He told me that he had no choice that it was going in anyway. I said, well, how did they know? But what had happened was he'd gone away to Peru or Cuba or somewhere like that with his brother. He'd been sat in a nightclub and he was a carpenter and he'd been sat in a nightclub and these guys approached him in Peru or Cuba and said, hi, we couldn't, you're, you're a carpenter, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, we heard you talking. Um, we're from Channel 5 and we're doing a documentary about builders. No, they weren't. They were sent by the mirror to um, get information on him to another country. Does everyone talk to strangers except for me? <laughs> you imagine someone coming up to me and saying, oh, yeah, you're a painter. I was, what, the, what the fuck are you? In fairness, Lincoln, we do get a lot of people inquiring. Asking to speak to you about stuff. Yeah, but I mean, I don't. But he probably doesn't, does he? I don't even tell him anymore. What was the origin again of me talking about? I was talking about your film with Louis. Oh, I, 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 I don't we, know. We started. With, I would have gone to bed tonight. Yeah, we started with the depression. Right. Documentary. Okay. I don't know how it's going to link in. I'll I'm, tell you I'm how it links in. Hear. I'll tell you how it links in because we went to court. All of these Levinson inquiry things are all split up. Mine was Operation Wheating and Operation Golding. So you are grouped in with different people mm -hmm. whose cases will be heard. I didn't have to prove anything because my guy had come clean. Right. He had he had told the police I hacked Denise Welsh. Right. So they came to me and said, you don't need to prove anything. Right. We have it all. I went to Putney. Da -da 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 -da. It was just a case of getting the right lawyer to get the right payout. So I got a payout. Mm-hmm. I should have got more, but I got a payout. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I have to, that time caused me so much mental anguish. Right. I'm putting some of that money into making a film about mental health, yeah. right. about mental illness. I don't care, well I do, but if no one sees it, if no one likes it, if no one appreciates it, I have to put something in to doing something to highlight mental illness. So I talked to a friend of mine, Nick Roundtree, who had always, who was an actor, but had always wanted to make a film, who had also had mental health issues himself. So understand the story. And um, he came up with, I came up with the sort of some of the premise. He came up with the idea of a, of, of a teenager, a teenage home invasion. And the, the teenager was the depression mm -hmm. in a sort of metaphoric kind of way. Right. 
Louis obviously was the go-to person um, to play the young boy. I think he was only 15 at the time, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And he was he was great in it. Mm -hmm. um, Black-Eyed Susan, which mm -hmm. they thought the character was called, was actually the name of the... N Nick wanted it done in this colour palette of yellow and black so that when the film started, it wasn't black and white, but it was very muted shades. And as the woman, me, m was improving health-wise, colour started to come in mm. with yellows. There'd be a yellow bread knife, mm. a yellow bread bin. It was done the very... The sun and the... The sun, the curtains shine, yeah, so coming in. And the flower... Like life coming the, into the... The sunflower with the very black center in the yellow flowers. One of those sunflowers is called A Black-Eyed Susan. Right. And that was the name of the film. Everyone thought it was, Susan was the name of the woman, but she didn't actually have a name, but that was okay. And um, we did very well at some festivals. You yeah. know, we put it through the LA, festival circuit. We won best film in, a, yeah. in an LA festival. And um, it was, um, it was a, it was a it was a learning curve for me to be an exec producer because Nick and I, who'd never fallen out, boy, I, God, we had some humdingers. You know, we're still friends to this day. Of course, it was artistic differences, but I felt that he didn't want me in the room sometimes, and he didn't <laughs> in the edit. He didn't want me in the room sometimes, but um, it was it was a fascinating experience, and we had fun doing the festivals and and the way that it was told did actually. You know, so many people who saw it said, wow, I didn't. And at the end, the final shot, you can still get it on YouTube, see it on YouTube. The final shot, whereas obviously Louis was nearly my height when he was the teenager. But the final shot is me walking away from camera with just my back holding the hand of a child who is dressed in the black hoodie and the black trousers, but is down there, which is basically my way of saying I'm, the depression never quite goes away, mm. but always I'm much is. always there. Mm. But I'm much more in control of it than I used to than I used to be. Type mm. of thing. So it was a different way of telling the story. Mm. Oh, darling, let's not have a break. Please let him talk about his crimpit. I totally forgot that oh. we were going to start about talking about your crimpit. Basically, no, they can show me this thing and i said oh, oh let's talk you, about it on the podcast you don't what know is it we're doing an unboxing show me it darling we? yeah show me a crimpet bless you show me a crimpet look look i <laughs> right so so this this i saw this advertised on instagram and i, I followed and mentioned something on one of the posts or something what you and then they said thing? no no they said we'll send you one we'll send you one so darling, they this is you sent, being an influencer for the course. crimpet so You're not wearing sent, a swimming costume, though. So they sent, Look at my Instagram if you want to know what that means. So they sent me one. Well, it's in here. Basically, it's you know it's gonna be a bit pointless because it's we're on a, it's a podcast, but it's well yeah, but you can show just yeah 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 yeah. Anyway, yeah. just explain it. In case All right, people okay. Can't see it so there's, it's very very simple. There's two. There's two pieces of plastic. I'm looking at a yellow square. And a black square. With like a crimp around the like edge. Like a crimp that's yeah. sort of uh, made of together. silicon, food, food grade silicon, I'm assuming. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah, only yeah. about two and a half inches, three inches. What oh, come on. Do it with your thumb. Um, How many inches oh, across? Well, I don't know. A thumb is that. That's an inch. That's three, three to three and a half. Three to three and a half. Oh, the crimp. Oh, the crimp. Oh, uh, yeah. It basically, it, uh, uh, so you three can, inches you, could, you could put, if you cut the, um, cut, if you cut the corners off the, you know, cut. Uh, you haven't told us what's for yet. Right, okay. So you put the bread inside. Ah, the bread. Okay. Right. You put the bread inside. The reason it was because I was going to get one of those, uh, what are they called? Breville? Are they Breville? Breville. Sandwich toasters. Sandwich toasters. Oh, I love them. Toast right. Maker, yeah. yeah, the toast maker. Yeah. But they're quite messy, right? They are, they are yes. quite messy, aren't they? To get they? to clean, they clean are. Clean yeah. out the cheese and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this one. But man, they're nice. Yeah, they're, they're, nice. they are lovely. Lovely, fresh, white slice in there. Cut round it. Right. And then you put your filling in. You put cheese and... Yeah. Ham, tomato, yeah, whatever yeah, you want yeah. in there, onions, whatever. Yeah. You get the other top of the crimp. Top of the crimp, you put it on top. That's so you got, thing so you, you got there. Yeah, so you Wait, got you two. A second piece of bread first, no? Yeah, second bit of bread. So you put your bit of bread in there, put your filling in, whatever you want. Yeah. Then you put your other bit of bread on top. Then you get this and you put it over the top and you basically crimp it, push crimp down crimp yeah. and crimp it. Well, yeah, but where, where, where are you heating it up? So what? No, so listen, that, listen. That's what you do, you open it. It, it seals the bread together right. like a lovely little package. Like a little, right. Yeah. And then you, so you take it out and you put it into the toaster. Into the Breville toaster? No, you just put it into a normal toaster. What? 
yeah, you see, so you, you crimp it together, crimp, 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 take it out, it open pocket, it out, a sandwich pocket. pocket, and put it in, put it in. You've got, and it goes lovely golden brown. Like a pop tart and all with your a sandwich yeah, in. Pop tart, but savory. And then you basically have any. Anything you want inside. Darling, we are trying the crimpage. So I'm crimping out. Why is it so small? I think I might have to have two than a piece of bread. Though, no, you're right. DK, we need two crimpits, don't we? Not no, I'm not one. in charge of crimpit. Well, no, but... If you were having a, a crimpit, you'd want two of those. Oh, well, I'd, I'd have four of these. Don't, uh, DK, you've just said, why is it so small? So don't make me look like the gluttony one. Right, so... Lighter Life won't be pleased at mm. all. I'm very, very well behaved. Carry on. So, yeah, so the... Basically... Oh, I wonder if Lighter Life might you know, start up on podcast. You know those... You know Warburton's do those little... You know Warburton's do those little, uh, like, really thin, like, nice, square... Yes. Quite, Warburton right. thins or whatever. Warburton thins. This, it literally... A Warburton thin fits in there perfectly. Right. And you can thin mm -hmm. it out. Yeah, just but does it have it. to? Is it meant to like overlap so that the crimp has something to grab? Yeah, yeah. So that go, basically, when that goes in, that goes, it, it pushes it all together, all nicely yeah, around. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you do that, or you can use bread, and you obviously just you know you cut your what's names off. Pass the crimp to me, please. So Stick Friday it night in the Welsh Townley household. Oh my crimp. God, it's all going on with the crimpit. There, crimping out into there. Don't squidge, get... squidge, squidge, crimp it. Maybe crimp it will be our sponsors. Sponsored they by better, crimp it and lighter now, light. Yeah, time they're Sponsored getting. by crimp it, breville and... Oh, no, we've been the breville. I Brevels still like are... a breville. We like a breville. We do, yeah. But this is an, an alternative to the breville. Crimp it, take it out, pop it in the toaster. Bob's your uncle. Well, what would... Yeah. Fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to come back next time. Well, and next time we'll come back. You can give us you the can crimp give it the, version. You know, I don't want to hear you've been electrocuted out by of five, tomatoes in your toast. Out five out Death that's by true, crimp that's it. True. You never that's know. No. So, guys, if there's anything that you've ever heard me talking about that you'd like to hear more of, or indeed anything you can suggest that me, DK and Lincoln can bring to the table, contact me on deniswelshpod at gmail.com. And um, indeed, if you've got any questions, ask away. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs>